Hello, hello, hello. So this is the second part of our series. Well, second part, but it's really the first part. In the first video, I gave you an overview of why we would even care about expressing proteins, purifying them, and identifying them. And now we're going to start talking about these processes in detail. So this video is on protein expression. The learning objectives for this topic are, one, you're going to be able to interpret and apply information from a simple plasmid map. You're also going to be able to describe how plasmids are inserted into bacteria. And finally, you're going to be able to outline the basic steps involved in protein expression. So with that, let's get started. I don't want to overwhelm you, so let's cover some of this up. So the first objective, we talked about a simple plasmid map. Well, you need to know what a plasmid is first. So a plasmid is just a circular piece of DNA. It's usually double-stranded. And a plasmid map is a diagram that details the promoters, genes, antibiotic resistance, and all the other features of a plasmid, how big it is. All of those things are part of the plasmid map. It's a lot of information. We're only going to go over a few key details because it could quite honestly be overwhelming when you see these things. Um, when we talk about cloning and kind of um, PCR and other DNA and RNA techniques, then we'll revisit plasmids and plasmid maps. But that's a whole, that's a whole different series. So let's not get ahead of ourselves. Okay. The technology of a white piece of paper. <laughs> so this is a sample plasmid. And I've got three different colors here. This blue, burgundy, and purple. And I'm seeing that the blue and the purple are kind of looking a little too similar. But hey, we're going to go with it. So usually in the middle of these guys, you have a plasmid name, you know, in the center. And you have the plasmid size. And it's usually in kilobase pairs. So the number of pace, base pairs here would be 8,000 base pairs, which is not small. Let's go over each of these colors, because each of these little blocks, the blue, the burgundy, and the purple, they represent different, um, different genes or parts of genes on this plasmid that are important to protein expression. So again, we're assuming that we're using a bacterial expression system, typically E. coli. Um, e. coli is used quite, quite heavily. It's really easy to manipulate. It's very readily available. And um, it's, it works by and large for, for most protein expressions. So the first section we're going to talk about is this blue guy over here hanging out on his own. That's the antibiotic resistance gene. It usually has its own promoter, and it provides resistance to an antibiotic that otherwise your bacteria would not have. So this gives the bacteria a reason to, to hold on to the plasmid and maintain it. We'll also be able to use this, uh, use the antibiotic resistance as a screening tool to figure out what bacteria we actually, what bacteria we have after um, introducing our foreign DNA which bacteria actually has this plasmid and which doesn't. If it doesn't have the plasmid, it's not going to survive. The second part that we're gonna cover is this burgundy piece. Now, the burgundy and the purple are kind of all one thing, but they serve two different purposes. So the burgundy part is what's called an inducible promoter. That means that it's activated by the addition of a substance or a temperature change or something like that. And that gives the researcher control over when and how long your protein of interest is expressed. So you're not going to actually make the protein until you add that substance. One substance that you'll see a lot is IPTG. And we're, gonna, we're not going to talk about what IPTG is, but just know that commonly this is used as... Um, there are lots of promoters that are inducible by IPTG for protein expression. Next, the purple region is the actual gene that we care about. So 
Its expression is controlled by the inducible promoter and it contains the code to build your protein of interest. That's what you have to insert into the plasmid in order to make the plasmid useful. <coughs> Excuse me. So we have this plasmid, it's great. It's got this inducible promoter, it's got our gene of interest, antibiotic resistance, so we can actually make sure the bacteria hold on to it. But it's not gonna actually be helpful unless we get it into the bacteria itself. Let's talk about that process next. Sorry, this slide isn't quite as colorful. I like colors, y'all. So the process of taking your foreign DNA, your plasmid, and shoving it into the bacteria is called transformation. Now you're probably not going to see shove as the verb in a formal definition for transformation, but my definition is it's the process of transferring foreign DNA, usually a plasmid, across a bacterial cell wall. But shove is a little bit more descriptive because it is kind of forceful. So there's a couple of different methods that you can use to do this. The two big ones are heat shock and electroporation. Let's talk more about kind of the pros and cons of these. So with heat shock, you really don't need anything, any specialized equipment. You just need to be able to have a, a water bath or something that has, you can do different temperatures um, and you need like an ice bucket. You know, so you have your bacteria, you introduce your DNA, you let it sit on ice, then you put it at 42 degrees for a minute, and then you put it back on ice, and then you're done. So it's very easy, um, very simple, and you don't need anything special. You know, you could literally, if you had the reagents in your home, you could do this in your kitchen. I wouldn't recommend it. I'm not telling you to do it in your kitchen but you could do it in your kitchen. That's just how easy it is. Electroporation, however, you do need special equipment. You need a special chamber, and you don't jump to using electroporation unless you have bacteria with particularly thick cell walls. So one example would be Mycobacterium tuberculosis. Its cell wall is amazing. Um, not great if you're sick with tuberculosis, but that bacteria is, those bacteria are really industrial. So you need to do more than just heat shock those. You actually need to use electroporation, which a little bit, it's a, it's a heavier tool, you know? It's like you've got your drill and then you've got like your jackhammer. This is the jackhammer, but you need special equipment for it. Either way, you're weakening the cell wall, you're increasing the uptake of your foreign DNA, and that's what we want. So whichever one you choose, that's gonna be the result. After you transform, then you plate the cells on agar with the appropriate antibiotic. And now we talked about the, um, the antibiotic resistance. I'll put this back up just for a second. So whatever antibiotic resistance gene is present in your plasmid, that's the antibiotic that you're going to use when you're plating and when you're doing liquid cultures. So you plate on agar with the appropriate antibiotic and then the next day you come back and your plate is all happy with round bacterial colonies, which probably will not be orange, but you know, you'll see distinct single colonies and they should be round and happy. And that means that you are ready to actually do your protein expression because we haven't actually gotten to that yet. Right now, all we did was make bacteria that have the protein of interest, um, the gene for the protein of interest inside the bacteria. We haven't expressed anything. So here we go. This is our scheme for how to actually express a protein. So this is our plate after we did our transformation. You use a sterile loop, sometimes you use a pipette tip, whatever you have that's sterile. You don't wanna be introducing a bunch of other bacteria and nastiness because it will also grow in your growth media. You pick up a single colony because you wanna make sure that 
you have bacteria that are all expressing the same thing. So if for some reason there's a mutation or something, you at least want it all to be the same. So, so you pick up your one colony and you add it to a, a test tube or something that's small uh, that contains liquid growth media. So you need something that's got amino acids and salts and all sorts of things that the bacteria need to grow and thrive. And you're gonna incubate that usually at 37 degrees Celsius. Um, sometimes you can grow it a little bit lower and slower. It just depends on what bacteria you use, but 37 degrees Celsius is pretty standard. So you grow that overnight and you're growing something small. You're only taking a single colony and putting it into, you know, five milliliters or so of liquid media. So not, not a lot. I mean, imagine if you were a single person and you were suddenly dunked into the ocean. You would not thrive, okay? It's just you and all this vast nothingness. And that's exactly what's going on with the bacteria. So you don't want to shock it so that it doesn't actually grow. You need to start small. So you make this small culture, and then the next day, you incubate your larger culture, so this is a big old flask, and you're pouring your bacteria into here. You can also use a pipette man if you don't have steady hands like I do. Um, anyway, you're growing your bacteria again at 37 degrees because we're not expressing anything yet. We're just trying to get the E. coli or whatever bacteria to multiply. We want to have enough bacteria to actually produce a sizable amount of protein. Um, the goal is usually somewhere in the milligrams. Finally, when you have enough bacteria, which you can test this by using the optical density or the OD, and basically the theory behind that is the more cloudy your media gets, so if you notice the light brown here versus the darker brown, the cloudier it gets, the more bacteria you have in solution. And typically, you want to induce when your OD or your optical density is around 0 0.6. That's not a hard and fast rule, but if you're just starting a protein purification, or an expression, excuse me, that's around where you want to start, around 0.4 to 0.6, and see, see how it goes. So we induce our bacteria with IPTG or whatever um, chemical is, works with your inducible promoter, and you get, get that protein expressing. Typically, you're going to reduce your temperature to somewhere between 16 and 30 degrees Celsius. Making protein takes a lot of resources, and we don't want the bacteria to try to be growing while it's making this protein because it's just not going to work. So you want to slow it down so that all they're really doing is making your protein of interest and hanging out in this happy media. After you've expressed for anywhere from 4 to 18 hours or so, then you're going to be ready to put your media into a centrifuge tube and pellet your bacteria. So you're gonna use a centrifuge, you're gonna gather all that bacteria in one tight little spot in the corner of your centrifuge tube. You dispose of the media on top, and it usually is like a lighter brown color because all of the bacteria are now in this pellet. And then you store the pellet for later use. Um, typically you store it in a minus 80 degree Celsius freezer. And even if you're planning on doing the purification like the next day, Freezing it and then thawing it is one of the many things that will help um, for the next part, which is protein purification. And we have to bust open all those bacteria to get at the protein. So this is where we'll stop for now with protein expression. And just to recap, you pick a colony, you incubate in a small liquid culture, use that to inoculate a bigger culture. And once you have enough bacteria in your big culture, you induce expression of your POI, and you usually lower the temperature. Then, after your growth period, you will pellet the bacteria using a centrifuge, dispose of the media, and store the pellet for later use. Now here are some questions that you can test yourself with, just to make sure that you actually understand 
the topic of protein expression. So these questions are not direct, you know, reiterations of the the learning objectives. They're questions where you have to think and apply knowledge. So in the first question, um, you have a plate, you've done a transformation of bacteria, you put it in the incubator and the next day, you don't have any bacterial growth. Why didn't they grow? And you have to use the plasmid map to figure that out. And there's other details in there too, but that's the basis, that's the basic gist of the question. In question two, you are asked about which transformation method you would try if you were just starting out using a new bacterial expression system to express a protein of interest. And the third one is asking you about why you need to grow a small starter culture to inoculate the larger culture during protein expression. And that's just, um, you know, we talked about that on the previous on the previous slide, if you can call these slides. Anyway, that's it for protein expression. Test yourself, make sure you understand it. If you don't, um, you can leave a, a comment below or you can just, you know, rewatch the video because you like my voice. <laughs> anyway, uh, good luck and use all the resources you can. This is just one. So if this didn't work for you or you need some more information, YouTube is great. Um, Wikipedia is great. So do yourself a, a good service and get all the information you can to help you understand protein expression and how it relates to the whole process of purifying and identifying a protein. That's all I have. I'll see you next time.